Your Highness, Your Excellencies, distinguished delegates, dear colleagues and friends, welcome to the United Arab Emirates, welcome to Abu Dhabi, and welcome to the pre-COP. Allow me first to thank you all for being here in person. This gathering has brought together 70 ministers and 100 delegations from all over the world. That is more than double the normal number of participation for a pre-COP. If anything, this really shows your commitment, and it gives me and my team great confidence. I thank you for being here. Friends and colleagues, I have been thinking very hard about what I wanted to say to all of you today. And as many of you know, I'm used to being on your side of things. I know the issues you are dealing with. And yes, I understand them. I am here to help you, and I am here to help this very important process. But I need you to meet me halfway. I need you to do your part and to do the work and to work with each other. I am determined to do all I can to make you and this process a success. We have to come through. We must unite. We must act. And we must deliver in Dubai. Colleagues, we must find common ground, ensure consensus, and resolve differences, because the risks will just keep growing if we keep kicking the can down the road. At the same time, if we succeed in coming together now, we have a huge opportunity in front of all of us. We can reimagine entire economies and put every nation on the path to a prosperous and sustainable future. And as I look around this room, I see so many ministers, and that is a lot of power in one room, in one place. And as the saying goes, with great power, comes great responsibility. In such challenging times, with tension and discord between countries and within countries, our responsibility is only greater. There are too many things dividing our world at this moment. And now, more than ever, we need to unite on climate and deliver a clear message of hope, a message of solidarity, stability, and prosperity. We need to show that the international community can deliver and send a clear signal that keeps 1.5 within reach. Let this process prove that multilateralism still works I believe we can fulfill our responsibility. And I know that we must. Let's remember that we have come a long way. Before the Paris Agreement, the world was heading for more than four degrees of warming. Today, according to the IPCC's latest reports, the world is heading for between two and three degrees. We are heading in the right direction, but nowhere near fast enough. At the Bonn conference in June, it was a struggle to even agree on an agenda. 
let alone a draft text for the global stock take. We must do better. At Aswan, only a few days ago, loss and damage got stuck in this agreement. We must do better. All the indicators are telling us we are far behind. Colleagues, we must do better. We have no time to waste on disunity. We must look beyond short-term thinking. We must end the excuses and the delays. And we must redefine our self-interest as our common interest. COP28 must deliver a robust global stocktake with a strong mitigation outcome. COP28 must deliver a comprehensive adaptation agreement and groundbreaking solutions on finance. This includes delivering on the fund and funding arrangements for loss and damage. And later this week, the UAE is convening an extra, a fifth meeting of the, international, of the Transitional Committee. We will do everything possible to give you the opportunity to find an outcome that works, an outcome that will ensure progress. Because what was promised in Sharm el-Sheikh must be delivered in Dubai. On mitigation, we need rapid progress to deliver a 43% cut in emissions by 2030. Because that is exactly what the science is telling us. This starts with a forward-looking GST that will shape economy-wide NDCs with absolute emission reduction targets that address all greenhouse gases. This can only work if we implement a fair, responsible, and a just energy transition on the basis of equity. And now, I know that there are strong views about the idea of including language on fossil fuels and renewables in the negotiated text. I need you to work together to come forward with solutions that can achieve alignment, common ground, and consensus between and among all parties. We must be responsible. We must be real. We must be true to the facts. We must be pragmatic. And we must leave no one behind. The fact is, we need to decarbonize the energy system of today, triple renewable energy and double energy efficiency. And on this, I am seeing some encouraging signs. 85% of the world's economy is now committed to triple renewables by 2030. And we need every country to sign up in line with national circumstances. And we need to address the supply and demand side of the current energy system at the same time. More than 20 oil and gas companies have answered COP28's call to end methane emissions by 2030. And I must say, I am encouraged because I see positive momentum with more joining day by day. And we are engaging with all high-emitting sectors, like heavy transportation, cement, steel, aluminum. We're working with them to lay out credible decarbonization plans that make real sense. On adaptation, we must establish a robust framework with clear indicators to guide implementation of the global goal on adaptation. We must end deforestation and preserve natural carbon sinks. And remember that our greatest ally in the fight against climate change is, in fact, nature. 
It is time for every nation to embed nature positive investments in their national climate strategies. It is time for well-funded and strategic national adaptation plans. And it is time for every nation to sign COP28's declaration on food systems and health. Excellencies, colleagues, we all know that a key success factor across the climate agenda is finance. In fact, fixing the climate finance challenge. Finance must be balanced between adaptation and mitigation. It is critical for the energy transition, which must work for everyone, everywhere, or it will not work for anyone, anywhere. That is why the money must flow smoothly. The money must flow fast to where it needs to go so that the Global South does not have to choose between climate action and development. They should do both in parallel at the same time. This means rebuilding trust. This means restoring faith and confidence. And that starts with transparency. Old promises must be kept, like the $100 billion pledge. And yes, I am grateful for the work of Germany and Canada on this and their reassurance that things are now on track. But as I stand here, I still cannot say with absolute certainty that it has been delivered. In addition, the Green Climate Fund's second replenishment has not met its target. There is still time to fix that. Adaptation finance must be doubled. Yes, there is still time to fix that. We need early pledges on loss and damage. There is still time to fix that. We also need to transform international financial institutions, build carbon markets, and incentivize private investment to turn billions into trillions. This is how we will rebuild confidence, trust, and restore faith in this very important and relevant process. Colleagues, I know and I get it. We have a lot to do. But remember, I have been on your side for many, many years and many times. I was in Paris, so I know what it takes, and I know we can do it. In fact, we have no choice but to do it. We have no choice but to make it happen. And the way we will do it is by trusting each other, by recognizing we share the same future, and by bringing everyone who can make a difference to the table. And as I have said many times, inclusivity is a defining principle of COP28. That includes being open to the private sector on a scale we have never, ever seen before. Decision makers in finance will be with us at COP28 in Dubai. Key figures in tech will be with us at COP28 in Dubai. Leaders across every significant industrial sector of the global economy will be with us at COP28 in Dubai. We need to include everyone, for all of us to move forward together. All views are welcome. All views are, in fact, needed. That is why we will include 1,000 mayors and subnational leaders. That is why we are determined to empower all those who suffer the most from climate change, including women and the young. And that is why we will have a day 
dedicated to the wisdom and experience of indigenous peoples. I ask you to commit to the spirit of hope and the spirit of openness, collaboration, and inclusivity. Friends and colleagues, before I conclude, allow me to take advantage of this opportunity to thank my entire COP28 team. As <laughs> as well as my climate champions, Her Excellency Razan, Her Excellency Shamma. The whole team have been working nonstop with determination to set you up for unprecedented success. Allow me also to recognize and thank my dear colleagues, the ministers, the ministerial pairs, for all their work leading on the global stock take, mitigation, adaptation, and means of implementation. Please keep pushing, keep going, get us to the finish line. My friends, it is time for all of us to get to work. Every day that passes, every moment we waste, we make our task even harder and more complex. I understand that at the point in the process, at this point in this process, people tend to hold their cards close to their chest. But I'm asking you, this time, let's do things differently. My kind colleagues and ministers must truly engage. Roll up your sleeves and lead. Negotiators must really listen to each other. Everybody must use this time wisely. Let's have the difficult conversations now. Don't delay, now. Let's show flexibility. Build mutual trust. The world is watching. Our nations, our communities, our families. And I know that our kids, they are all watching. Let us please unite. Let's act and let us deliver. I will give you the space, but there is no room for divide. I will also roll up my own sleeves and be by your side. Together, let us show that humanity can find solidarity. Again, let's unite, let's act, and let us deliver in Dubai. I thank you, and I wish you all a successful recall. Thank you.